G'day, it's Joe Rasmus from Southern Cross Combat, and ahead of UFC 305, I'm talking to Mr. Steve Erseg. Steve, how are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Good, I'm very glad to hear that. I always appreciate the time. I'm sure it's a hectic time for you, so I do appreciate you talking to me today. What has today been for you this lovely Thursday? Uh, yes, yeah, so all I've done is I've woken up, I've come to training, which I do every single Thursday, 8 o'clock, I'm here, get a hour and a half, two hours in a training and then had some interviews. So, um, yeah. The grind, uh, never stops. No, I don't think if you want to be really good at something, I don't think it can. Now, uh, I, I, unfortunately I didn't get a chance to, to speak to you before the last fight. Uh, however, obviously I sent you my love and, and you put on a, a fantastic uh, performance. We talked about it a little bit, uh, before we started, but it's nonetheless, uh, it was a question I had prepared. How has life changed for you since challenging for a UFC title? Yeah, life hasn't changed. I mean, I get recognized a little bit more. Um, but other than that, I mean, still everybody that's actually close to me and uh, like in the gym, at home, family, all that sort of stuff, they don't treat me any different as I'd expect them not to. Um, and I'm still in the gym every day working hard. So nothing's changed. I'm just apparently a little bit more, uh, a little bit more well-known. I guess. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the, the kind of new level of fame? I mean, it's a little bit, it's weird for me, to be honest. Like I did um, a meet and greet for Mitsubishi in Midland. And uh, the whole time I was like, I don't know what they expect to happen, but I can't imagine that many people are going to rock up to see me. And yeah, people will line up at the door early. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just Steve. I don't know why you care so much about me, like taking time out of your day. So that's, that stuff is weird to me still, but um, yeah, other than that, normal. Do you now have a, a new vehicle or are we still rocking the Toyota Corolla? No, we got the uh, the Mitsubishi Triton now. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that was on the list. That was on the list, yeah. How are you finding the Triton? Not sponsored, by the way. At least I'm not. Oh, I'm, spo I'm sponsored. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then, yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm sponsored, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, yeah, no, it's no, it's a great car. I do like it very much. Um, it's uh, I got <laughs> they with the sponsorship, they got your name on the side, so it says MA's Astro Boy. So I'll be driving down the street, and people will be like, "Oh, hey, Steve, blah blah." So why not we have a chat with people before I drive off at the at the light? So that's I got also something that's like a little bit weird, but um, yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. So yeah, good. <laughs> that's actually so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, uh that fight. Uh, with Pantoja, uh, something that's been a theme every t uh, nearly every time we've spoken to each other is the concept of toughness. Yeah, uh, that fight didn't go your way, but do you think you're tougher than Alex Pantoja? Yes. <laughs> um, he has an unbelievably hard head, so I'm not saying that he's not super tough, but I think, um. I just think I'm tougher. I know he won the contest and I've, I guess me trying to, me trying to justify losing to myself, perhaps I said, I may have lost the contest and he was good enough to get the points decision and all that sort of stuff. But if we we're going to fight to the death, there was only one person winning that fight and that was me. So um, that's how I'm looking at this one. How uh, you, you kind of touched on it there. How has it been to kind of come to terms with the loss? Yeah, it's, it was, or it is super devastating. Like it's something that you've dreamed about your whole life and you got the opportunity and then you fumbled the bag right at the end. And so, um, yeah, it's, I also know that it was a great opportunity. I learned a lot and I just got to make sure. I do everything in my power to make sure I get back there and do better. So um, lots of good things came out of it. Obviously I wish I won, but you can't dwell on the past for too long. You've got to move on, improve yourself. Of course. And you know, you, you, you enter fights to win, of course. And as you said, you'd prefer to, uh, but tying into the fame kind of conversation, I feel like, in a way, I feel like you're kind of the uncrowned king. I feel like a lot of people, <laughs> I, like there are people I saw, uh, you did a live stream on Instagram with someone and that was one of the top comments. Yeah. How, 
what is that feeling like where you don't necessarily hold the belt, but you kind of got the respect? Yeah, I think uh, um, the main reason anybody does something like this is because they want the validation from those around them. As weird as that sounds, I don't feel like I post a lot because I don't care. Not that I don't care. I don't post a lot because I don't need people to tell me how good I am all the time or hate on me or what I don't yet yeah, don't need that sort of stuff in my life. But with the people around you, whatever you do, you want the validation of the people around you um, to say, even if they don't say it with words to like, action show you that oh yeah you did good you did well well whatever it is and like fighting is one of those things like you want people around and i'm going to use the word tough again all i've wanted is the people around me to acknowledge me as like really tough and so that's probably so to see everybody in the comments and stuff say oh i'm crown king it's like oh people do think i'm tough people do think i'm good like as much as i don't try to um live my life based on what others think of me. Um, it is a natural part of being human, I think. Now, uh, I, when talking about you to other people, uh, I talk about how uh, you're the man who speed ran to the UFC title. <laughs> it was, yep. so, uh, we were talking just before uh, off air about a, a year ago, February. So just over a year ago, it was getting signed to the UFC and then it was yes. bang, bang, bang uh, title shot. Uh, please tell me you're not still on the 12 and 12 base contract for fighting for a title. Please tell me that. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not. All right, good. I'm very glad to hear yeah. that. Uh, talking about uh, that though, when you look at that timeline of just absolutely blitzing to the top of the card, to the top of the division, what do you make of that? Because just over a year ago, you were fighting the night before UFC Perth. And now you're fighting yeah. in a co-main event. So the first thing I want to say is um, it relates to my favorite meme about this whole experience. And my favorite meme is a picture of Bilal Muhammad. And it's like, oh, 12 victories in a row, five years in the UFC, still can't get a title shot. And it's like, Steve Ersig, hold my beer. That I thought was just so funny. Just like all I did was I rocked up, took a couple short notice fights, and I'm like, oh yeah, why don't I just fight for the title? I I, I don't know. It's I like to think I got the opportunity because I'm easy to work with, and I want to prove that I'm the best. And I think a lot of people want to preserve their undefeated streak, or they want to. Uh, make sure they take the right fights um, because they do want to get to the title and everybody has that same goal. But one thing that I take pride in is that I'm willing to find out who the best is, no matter how scary they are, um, no matter how late notice, all that nonsense. So um, I take pride in that. I think that's probably why I got given a title fight so far. Before the, before the title fight, after your last victory, you called for Brenda Moreno when they get back to you and they say, no, nah, we're just going to have you fight Pantoja. Like, <laughs> what is that like? Yeah, I sort of started laughing, honestly, just because um, dad came to me and he goes, I think it's a very good chance that you fight Pantoja next. I went, you're an idiot. What is wrong with you? There's no way I'm fighting for a belt after this fight, all that sort of stuff. And then they call me. And I went, I'm going to have to call dad and apologize. <laughs> so uh, it was, yeah, it was crazy. Um, it was the most surreal moment was the look on people's faces when I told them that I'm fighting for a title because I had, I had to keep it under wraps for a while because I didn't want to say anything until the contract was signed, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, oh, by the way, I'm fighting for the world title against Pantoja. And they sort of laugh. Oh, yeah, sure, man. I'm like, no, 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 seriously. I'm, I'm like, are you serious? And like the look on people's face was like the coolest part of the whole thing, I think. Of family and friends, was there yeah. one person in particular that had a specific reaction? Um, no, nah, I couldn't put it down to one person that had a specific reaction. It was just like this, the same look on everybody's faces, I think, when I told them. Uh, talking about uh, this upcoming fight at UFC 305, uh, you were fighting Kai Kara France. Uh, what is that like for you? Because in the past, you've talked about him being someone that I don't necessarily want to use the phrase looked up to, but someone you very well respected throughout their career. 
Yeah, uh, it's a bit weird. I I think I made this clear a few times that if I could avoid fighting Kai, I would. Um, I think, again, he's another Anzac. Um, if I don't have to fight him, I, I didn't want to. But at the same time, I'm not going to say no to people um, that I respect. We're sort of in a position where we're both at the top of the division. We both wanted to fight on Perth and a win over like, either way, him beating me or me beating him puts us in a really good spot to fight for the title again. So um, I said yes because, again, I want to prove that I'm the best and he's one of the best. So we're going to find out. I remember the when I first saw you get asked about the, the Taikawa France fight, I think this is pre-Pantoja. Someone floated the idea to you, and you kind of gave that response of, of due yeah. to that respect, you don't, you don't. If you could avoid it, you would. Um, yeah. After that Pantoja fight on a TV show in New Zealand, he did not share that sentiment. He no. kind of called for you. Yeah. What was that like when you when you saw him call for you? I mean, I understood why he asked for me. I know he wants to get to a title too, and I seem like the guy to do it. I came off the loss for the title, and. He wants to get there as fast as possible. So if he beats me, it puts him in really good stead. So I understood it. I have no hard feelings. It's just, it's the business that we're going to fight. You're someone who is, uh, has looked at his career for an extensive period of time. Uh, what do you make of him as a fighter and what are your thoughts on him? He's very explosive. Um, he's good on the feet. Obviously his right hand is his most dangerous weapon. And it sounds like, oh, if he's that good on the feet, I'm better on the ground than him. So I'll just take him down. But he's unfortunately quite good at stopping people from taking him down. So um, I need to make sure that um, I set it up correctly if I am going to shoot. And um, yeah, I, just, I, I do honestly think I have more weapons than he does. And I think that over the course of the fight, that'll make itself known. Uh, there was the ticket <sighs> sales press conference. Uh, that happened. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory's not the best. Uh, there wasn't a press conference uh, for the UFC in Brazil, so you hadn't really had that opportunity. How was it to kind of have that moment where you're you're doing like the press conference thing? No, it was very cool. Um, honestly, it felt like I was a fan watching Israel Adesanya and Driggers the Plessis just with the best seat in the house. I was sitting there going, oh, I wonder what he's going to say now. Oh, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> just, <laughs> that's how it felt to me. Um, so, it was, yeah, very cool to be there. And, um, yeah, I went backstage after the whole face-off thing between them. I was pumped to go. I was like, yeah, I just, yeah, very exciting to be there and feel the energy and that sort of thing. If I'm not mistaken, yet again, please correct me, uh, the seating arrangement was left to right. <laughs> Ty Drickus, yeah. Izzy, you. Yes. W was that awkward at all to sit next to Izzy and have to be like, I am going to fight your friend? No, not really. Like, um, I'd never, I, sorry, I'd once taken a photo with Izzy back, back in the day before he fought in the UFC, but I never actually had a conversation with it or anything with him. So I didn't know what it would be like when I first rocked up, but he was like super lovely person. Like he was, um, yeah, I was, yeah, very good human, I thought. So um, it wasn't awkward at all. Good to have a chat with him. And then you're yeah, sitting next to him. Yeah, I knew there was not, like no beef between me and Kai, so I wasn't going to get awkward in that way. Um, yeah, it felt, honestly, it sort of felt like Anzacs versus Drickus. That's how it felt on the, <laughs> on the stage. I was going to say, it probably was more awkward for Kai to be sitting next to Drickus probably. than it was for you next to Izzy. Yes. Uh, I feel like I may have asked this a little bit earlier, but I still, I still think it's really important to talk about the fact that this is kind of for the within Australia this is the dream you're fighting at the home <laughs> the hometown sold out biggest venue you can do in the hometown how is that for you yeah it's awesome um it's a, yeah what kids dream of when they think of playing professional sport like you grow up playing AFL for or playing Aussie rules football, thinking about what it'd be like to play the AFL, you think of the grand final, you take a mark with like three seconds left to go on the last to put yourself in front, the siren goes, you hear, and then the yell of the crowd, yell, uh, that, that's what you envisage, right? And that's sort of the position that I've found myself in. I get to fight in my hometown, I get to walk out to the adulation of the crowd, and then 
assuming I win, especially if I win in emphatic fashion, you get the roar of that crowd. And it's like that culmination of that moment. It was, it will be very special. Talking about the AFL, I saw you got a chance to go and meet with the Weagles. How was that? <laughs> that was so cool. Again, I, it's one of those things where it's like, oh my God, that's Liam Ryan. That's this guy. That's that guy. Um, and then they're like, oh, hey, Steve. I'm like, how do you know who I am? Like, I'm just a fan of you guys. So that was so cool. Um, got to uh, kick the footy with them, got to go look at the room and have a chat and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that was, again, one of those things that um, you sort of can't put into words, I guess. Just very, very cool. Uh, no offense to the rugby guys that you met over in Vegas, but better than meeting the rugby guys? If I was a rugby fan, it would have been um, comparable. But obviously, the, I was an AFL fan and not just an AFL fan. I was an Eagles fan for my whole life. So that was um, definitely more special. After we had that conversation, the last time we talked about the rugby, I remember I saw that photo of you like in the cage screaming. Do you? Is it Weagles colored mouth guard? Yeah, it, sure, it sure was, yeah. Oh, exactly. I, soon, <laughs> yeah. I remember afterwards you were like, I'm more of an AFL fan. I saw that photo. Yeah. I was like, well, that makes sense. Yes. you. Something that I feel like has been touched on in this interview and something we've talked about in the past, I think after your UFC debut, is that kind of concept of like a fan that has just gotten in there. Yeah. You've, you've talked about it here. You talked about it in the past. Do you think that will last forever? I hope it does. Um, yeah, I definitely hope it does. Because, yeah, getting to meet all these people and that you've looked up to for so long or, it's, it's, yeah, very cool. If I get so self-important that at some point I couldn't care less who I'm talking to, then it'll be sad, that's for sure. Talking about uh, fans and being fans of things, <clears throat> a gentleman by the name of uh, Corey Sandhagen I had heard in a podcast or some interview talked about how he was a fan of you and your style. Yeah. I was wondering yeah. if you've ever spoken to Corey. He messaged me after the match no fight and asked if – um where I train, if we could do some training together and that sort of stuff. I was like, man, you're like one of the best in the world. What are you talking to me for? It's like, yeah, it was so cool. And unfortunately, yeah, I live in Australia and he lives, um, is it Denver or I can't remember where he lives. Um, but he yeah, lives plenty far away. So I don't think him making a trip out to Perth is in his best interest. But if I'm ever in the area, I would love to take him up on his offer and do some training. Tell him to get on the flight. <laughs> again i'm not that important that uh, i'm going to be demanding people to do that i'm happy to make the uh make the effort to go myself steve you say you say that he's one of the best in the world why is he talking to you steve you're one of the best in the world yeah again i don't yeah it doesn't feel like i'm anything but steve um i'm not steve erseg i'm not astro boy i'm just steve and um i'm just blessed with the opportunities that i've been given uh you kind of touched on it earlier <laughs> A victory in this position, beating Kai Kaikar France, a man who's fought for an interim title before. Uh, do you think that puts you right back, like fighting for a title after? No, I think I have to win after Kai, at least one more, but likely two. Yeah. Do you think, is there any idea of who you think those two people, one or two people could be? I think... It depends when Moreno comes back as well, but I think uh, Miro Albazi is likely one. And then, yeah, Moreno or um, Roy Vial, something like that, is likely too. The reason I ask is you talking about, and I understand why, like staying humble and such, but will anything make you feel like, not just Steve, but like Steve Ersig, the champ. Well, winning the title, well, then eventually will you be like, maybe I am the best in the world? I'll believe I'm the best in the world, but I hope that at no point I think I'm super important. I, yeah, I just, I don't want to come off like that. I don't like it when people think they're too good for other people. So I'll think, yeah, I'm the best in the world. But at the same time, if I, for some reason, decide that I'm too good to help the people around me or whatever it is, I'll be very disappointed in myself. Talking about helping the people around you and working with people. I spoke to Cody Haddon recently and I hadn't realized that uh, you guys had been training together. He is prepping for Dana White's contender series. 
Uh, how is it uh, training with Cody Haddon? Tiring. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, um, I don't know if he said anything about it, but it feels like our fight um, on Eternal every single time we train together. It's just like, yeah, it's horrible. Um, like, obviously, great training, but you get nervous before he comes and you know it's going to be just yeah whether you're trying to not trying to knock each other out or anything but it's just like super tiring the pace is very high lots of scrambling it's just it's exhausting (laughs) Uh, how do you think he will do on dana white's contender series i think cody's really good so i think he will do very well i hope him all the best and um i'm sure sure he'll get it done if obviously if everyone had a magical crystal ball everyone would be awesome uh, what do you see the the ceiling for Cody Haddon? I don't know. Um, I think he has all the all the skills to be right up there with the best in the world. I just, yeah, I'll leave it up to him. I'm not going to make any predictions for him or say what his ceiling is. Like, yeah, he'll decide that himself. Uh, with the Pantoja fight, uh, you were selling T-shirts and mugs of memes of yourself as, <laughs> as Steve Carell. Uh, yes. Last time we spoke, you talked about that. You talked about the internet thinks I look like a guy who fixes computers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was it to kind of lean into that a little bit? That oh, was fun. Like uh, I'm a fan of the office and um, I'm happy to make jokes at my own expense. So um, enjoyed the, uh, the response from it. I enjoyed the whole thing. And uh, yeah, if one day, um, I can somehow convince Steve Carell to do some lookalike thing with me. That'd be even cooler. <laughs> Get it on the bucket list. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Steve, I always thank you so much for the time. It is always a pleasure. Uh, between now and then, I feel like the fight has zoomed up. I was like, close yes. my eyes and suddenly it's time to fight at home. <laughs> uh, what is on the cards for you for the next, until the fight? Yeah, just... Uh the volume of training goes down, the intensity will stay high. Um, there'll be shorter, sharper sessions. And um, then the the weight cut. And after that, we get to go to business. The fun part begins. That's it. What's uh, the rest of today? What are you doing for the rest of the day? Um, probably go home, take the dog for a walk, and then I'll come back tonight and train. The grind never stops. Steve, I thank you so much for the time. It is always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Thank you very much.